Hi, this is Misha, and this is part two in our series on Japanese small arms. This part will be covering uh, weapons of World War II, not just used in, but you know, developed during World War II, right before. So to start off with, we'll have the Type 99 Arasaka. Well, in, uh, in Japan, they had um, gone up against the 8mm Mauser round while fighting in China during the 1930s, in, well, 1920s and 1930s. And while the 6.5mm was a very good anti-personnel type of cartridge, it didn't have a lot of um, penetration and whatnot. So it was decided to design a new cartridge for the Arasaka, which became 7.7. .7. This round has its genesis back in the late 1920s when there was a couple of older cartridges rimmed and whatnot. But um, the modern 7.7 .7 by 58 was inspired by the 303 British, but unlike the British, it did not have a rimmed. It was a, a rimless cartridge or a recessed rim, if you like. So in 1938, the team at Nagoya set about redesigning the Arasaka from the Type 38 to the Type 99. Of course, the biggest change was firing the, uh, the new round, but they also wanted to take the opportunity to upgrade the gun itself. They wanted to make it cheaper to mass produce and also more durable. So they had quite a few changes. They're small but noticeable between the 38 and the 99. For one, the receiver forging was simplified. I can't see anything on camera, but it was. The barrel bands went from being machined and held on by spring clips to welded and stamped and held on with screws, big wood screws. Quite a few other little parts were made of stamped metal. They also took this opportunity to start chrome lining both the bore and the bolt face. Actually, the Type 99 was the first military rifle that went into production that had chrome lining as a standard feature. This was done because obviously the Japanese were fighting in, in jungle and humid environments quite a bit, so it was kind of seen as a um, necessity. Now this is obviously not the standard Type 99. This is the Type 99 long rifle. This pattern was officially adopted in 1939 and initially the idea was to produce a long rifle and carbine just as had been done with the Type 30, the, the Type 22 Murata for that matter, and of course the Type 38. However, only about 38,000 long rifles were produced and no carbines were. The carbine never made it out of the prototype stage. The reason was pretty simple. They discovered that the 31-inch barrel really didn't give much more range or accuracy. And they also found that the 19-inch barrel with the new 7.7 cartridge had uh, excessive muzzle flash, uh, felt recoil, etc., etc. So what they did is they compromised with a short rifle, which we'll get to in just a minute, which would become the standard production and it many more were produced. About 1.5% of total Type 99 production was of the long rifle style. Well this rifle still features a dust cover, although they would simplify these slightly internally from the Type 38. It has fold-out anti-aircraft sights. We'll get a little bit more to those in a minute, but the long rifles did have aircraft sights, slightly different from what would be used on the short rifle. And of course, this fold down monopod. Reach up here. For resting on the ground, stabilizing shots and whatnot. All 38 long, I mean, 99 long rifles would have these. Also, interestingly, the cleaning rod is retained by the spring-loaded button right here. So, 
protected front sight, just like on the late 38s. Has an aperture peep rear here. Yeah, this was the Type 99 long rifle. These were produced by two arsenals, Series 1 Nagoya, which this one is, and then also you'll find some of Series 35. And uh, there's a lot out there on the interwebs about the series marks. There were about nine arsenals that would ultimately produce the Type 99, and each series was 100,000 rifles, so on and so forth. You can check out our blog article for, for more details on that. Plus, I'm not even going to try to do a lot of Japanese words. My speech butchers them, and I do not know. This here is the standard Type 99 short rifle. This pattern went into production in 1941 or late 1940, we're not sure, and it would become the standard. This is early on what was made. It has a barrel that's just a smidge under 26 inches, same monopod, different, I mean, they did, they're not interchangeable, but the, they're the same style. Same anti-aircraft sights. These are pretty well maligned, and it is a goofy feature by today's standards. But you have to remember that when these were designed in the 1930s, and at that time Japan had been fighting mostly in China and, and elsewhere in Asia, the idea was more for mass volley fire against low-flying, slow-flying aircraft like biplanes and bombers. So the idea is if you had a couple of hundred guys, they could lead on a slow-flying plane, and they were hoping, because of the more powerful 7.7mm cartridge, they could actually do some damage or at least get the, uh, the bomber to uh, break off its uh, bombing run. So it wasn't really successful, but it wasn't quite as ridiculous as it might seem at first glance. Still has a dust cover here. But internal five round magazine, that's really unchanged. One thing that is changed, the release for the mag is now in the trigger guard. You pull back and it's hinged in the front so the floor plate can't get lost. I think that's probably a really good change. That way you just... Um, you can still dump your ammunition out if you need to or for cleaning, but you don't have to worry about losing your floor plate. The short rifle has side mounted sling swivels. Full length upper hand guard. Same type of cleaning rod retention as in the long rifle. Yeah, this went into production in 1941. And this is the full Type 99 pattern. This would stay into production with all these features until late 1942 or early 1943. And then the simplifications for war would begin, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. But yeah, this was what was supposed to replace the Type 38. It actually never did because Japan was fighting America and, and others in the war. So the 38 was kept in production until 1942 and was kept in the field until the end of the war. But uh, they did produce quite a few of these in a short period of time, around uh, 2,600,000, give or take, between 1940 and 1945. So they, they did crank these out. And of course, not all of them are the full pattern. A lot of them are what are today called last stitches, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, yeah, the Type 99 Japanese Arasaka short rifle. This would be standard issue for both the Army and the Navy. Alright, we'll move on. Alright, up next we have quite an interesting rifle that is only recently getting kind of a collector interest. This is a Japanese Type I often called the Arasaka Carcano, or the Carcano Arasaka. The Type I is actually, they were built in Italy by Turney, Brescia, and Beretta for the Japanese under contract. Well, what happened around 1937, 
the Japanese army was taking all the rifles that Japan's own arsenals could, uh, could produce. So there were no rifles left over. All the production was being swallowed up by the army for their war in China, their land war in China. So the Navy couldn't get a hold of rifles to equip its uh, special landing forces and, you know, for onboard ships and, you know, guard posts on shore and stuff like that. So what they did is they sent a team over to Europe to talk to the Italians because uh, Japan and Italy were, were allies through, through the Axis powers and all that. Well, they worked it out and um, Italy started producing a hybrid Carcano Arasaka for the Japanese Navy, which is the Type I here. It's built on a standard Carcano type receiver with a standard Carcano type bolt. standard Carcano type safety here. However, it has quite a few Arasaka features as well. Starting at the muzzle, we have a barrel that's just a hair under 31 inches. It's like 30.75 inches long. We have an Arasaka style cleaning rod. held in here. It takes the Type 30 bayonet, which the Japanese just have a love affair with. They keep using it. Standard rear sight here. Ladder style. More like an Arasaka Type 38. Most importantly, it has a Type 38 style magazine internal five round versus the single stack Carcano that would hang down. These also have a two-piece wooden stock like an Arasaka. These all seem to be separating at least the, all the type eyes I've had I, to one extent or another. Interestingly it's a two-piece stock but Italy built these out of harder wood than what Japan was using, so it actually weighs quite a bit more than a uh, Type 38. But the other, the, most of the dimensions are um, the same. The trigger is also Carcano style, by the way. Well, these started to be produced in late 38 and were delivered throughout the later part of that year in 1939 to the Navy. Some sources claim about 60,000 were made, but as common as, the, as these are, I'm going to say the sources that say about 120,000 are probably more accurate. And again, you have three arsenals turning these out, so you know, roughly 30,000, 40,000 per arsenal it doesn't seem unreasonable for a year and a half production period. They were delivered to the Navy, and um, most were kept on lockers on board ships or in the shore facilities and, and didn't really see a lot of use. Some were also given over for training duties. They were actually quite popular with marksmen because of, again, the long barrel and the 6 five, five 50 Arasaka cartridge they fired was quite accurate, and the added weight helped. However, some were used by the special landing forces of the Japanese Navy, so they, they did go ashore, they did um, see combat against American soldiers and, and, and allies. So the, uh, the Type I did see action and proved uh, reliable, but it's always kind of been uh, um, a secondary weapon. It wasn't a Japanese-made gun, so it didn't get a lot of attention there. Also, since it doesn't have the Royal Chrysanthemum on it, collectors have often kind of overlooked these for some reason. All of these were produced as long rifles. Now, there is one interesting small variation. This one that I'm holding here has a long stock. It's about an inch long. Then the one I've got over here on the table. Same uh, type of, let me set this down. This type eye over here has a stock that came from the factory that was one inch shorter. And the best I can figure reading around 
The original longer stock was done away with because of Japanese soldiers and the, and the shorter statue. Around that time, uh, most Japanese weren't, they weren't tiny, but like Americans, they were shorter back in that era. They were about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, at the time, maybe even 5'5", five, five, so the shorter length of pole was beneficial. So you'll see some type eyes with the um, shorter buttstock. Again, about 120,000 were produced before America got in the war. They were used by Japan throughout World War II, and many were captured on the mainland after the end of the war by American soldiers and brought home. Only recently have collectors really started to give the Type I notice, and uh, I think they should. I think it's a, I've always thought these are very interesting guns. I like Italian guns, I like Japanese guns, so the, uh, the collaboration of the two I think is interesting. Plus, these are often in really good shape. They're mechanically solid. They're, they shoot really well. So yeah, don't, don't overlook the Type I when it comes to Japanese guns. I think it's a very interesting uh, part of history. Yeah, I thought we'd just share this before we get back into Arasaka's. We'll move on. Alright, next we have quite a famous and a very interesting Arasaka. This is the Type II Paratroopers Rifle, also known as a takedown rifle. Well, as World War, I, or World War II kind of began before the U.S. entered, Japan was mostly relying on its naval landing forces for invasions. It had kind of neglected its paratrooper corps, it, it kind of ignored it, um, but as, as, as war with the USA loomed, it decided it needed to get involved. So around 1940, work began on creating a takedown rifle. Well. They were, they were basing it on the, at that time, very recent, very newly adopted Type 99. And the first takedown rifles they came out with in prototype form were the Type 0 or the Type 100, if you wish. The Type 0 broke into two pieces. It was basically just a standard Type 99 taken off the production line at Nagoya, cut in two pieces, and it had an interrupted thread to connect the barrel. So you would uh, pull the pin out, pull, actually pull the pin down, and then turn the bell about 45 degrees and pull it off the receiver. Also, the cocking handle on the Type 0 was threaded, so it screwed into the bolt. Neat, but not strong, and that never really left the prototype stage. Well, in 1941, the Type 1 paratrooper rifle came out. What the Type 1 was, they took older Type 38 carbines, and they essentially, and again, the Type 38 carbine would fire 6.5, not 7.7, .7, and would have a 19-inch barrel. They would cut the buttstock off right here at the tangs, and then they would put a hinge, almost like a door hinge, and they would so that it would have a folding stock. Again, neat, and it definitely made for a compact package, but because of the folding stock, it was double wide and um, each gun was basically manually converted so it took a lot of time and, and the stop mechanism was not terribly strong and durable. It seems like about 300 Type 1s were essentially custom built and all of those ended up in the hands of the Japanese Navy who by this point if you haven't guessed kind of always gets the leftovers of the second second best stuff. So, that was 1941. In 42, 1942 the Type 2 came out which is what I'm holding here. The Type 2 kind of returned to the original idea of the Type 0, which was a takedown with two sections, and these would be stored in a bag separately. You unscrew this here, then you pull a wedge out, and then simply it pulls apart. Let's set this down over here for a second. So if you look inside the receiver, you can see where the wedge goes through, right here. and then to lock it in, it screws in, it's threaded as you can see, and the bolt just hangs here, and this is your half of your gun. The other half, the barrel, is very similar to a standard Type 99 short rifle. The barrel is just about 25 and some change inches long. 
can see it has a cut out here for the wedge to go through and then it sticks back into the receiver for the, where it will mate up where, where the bolt now the bolt does lock into the receiver not the barrel here so something to notice so together these will be carried in a uh, jump bag and then a symbol on the battle, on the battlefield once the, the paratrooper would, would hit earth quite a neat design pretty easy to um, take apart yeah, between 1942 and 1944, the Nagoya Arsenal, they produced these exclusively, would turn out between 21,000 and 24,000 Type 2 paratroopers rifles. So, it's being on me here. So it kind of screws in. Get this all lined up nice and good here. There we go. hand tighten it down. It's got this nice little kind of grenade clip here. And fold it over and you have a functional rifle in 7.7. Same uh, dust cover type bolt, same five round magazine. It has the same cleaning rod retained with a spring loaded pin here. The cleaning rod is a little bit shorter than standard so it'll fit in the takedown barrel. These did not ever have monopods. It was just smooth down here, but they did come with anti-aircraft sights like you've seen in the other Type 99s. I like it. A paratrooper, an aircraft gun with anti-aircraft capability. Most all of the Type 2s have these sights. The last three or 4,000 though were manufactured without them, but the majority did. Still has a side mounted sling swivel up front has a side mount below and it has this cut off behind it not cut off but this uh, cut in the stock here this kind of ovular cut and that's really it I mean you can see it's got this big metal piece to hold it together this is the uh, the type 2 paratrooper rifle they actually made these in uh, ooh, relatively large numbers typical trigger yeah, obviously these would, would see combat throughout World War II once they went into action. They were used by paratroopers and really towards the end of the war, anyone who could get their hands on them. These were a popular uh, trophy for U.S. soldiers coming back from the Pacific because they were unique. Even back then when Japanese guns weren't thought so highly of, the paratroopers were kind of looked at and thought, eh, that's, that's different. And yeah, this was the successful Japanese Type II paratrooper rifle. Next up, we have a mid-war mid production Type 99. This is not a last ditch, not yet. This rifle was produced by the Nagoya Arsenal in 1943. I believe it's part of early series 7 or late series 6. Sorry, uh, little fiddly markings aren't exactly my strong suit. Well, as I said, through 1942, the Type 99 maintained you know, its, its standards and, and was kept the same. Well, by 43, Japan was kind of fighting a, a protracted war with the USA and started making manufacturing shortcuts in most all of its firearms. And of course, the Type 99 was no exception. At first, they were just deleting things that were really unnecessary. This is a relatively early gun for the um, changes so we'll start here we still have a protected front sight we still have a bayonet lug for the type 30 bayonet that they will use to the end we have a short cleaning rod though that instead of being retained by a button simply unscrews let me get this out here some of these are really stiff this one's not so bad as you can see it's it's very short has a hole in it. Basically this was meant to be used as a sinker. Tie a rope to it, throw it down your bore, clean your bore that way. I'm starting to use a little tiny cleaning rods. Still has a full length upper hand guard here. Not 
The barrel band here is simplified, it no longer has the split in top. Also, as you can tell, the monopod is gone along with the lug for it. Some transitional guns will have no monopod but still have the block down here where it could have been mounted. This one, they, they've done away with that. Also, the anti-aircraft sights are now gone. This one still has adjustable sights, as you can see, but they're on a short ladder. There was also a transition where they were still using the tall ladder, and they even usually had still had the, the places for the AA sights, but they never left the factory with them. So, still has a peep here, adjustable on all that. By this point, these were often not shipping with dust covers. I can't swear that this one did or didn't come with one. It, can't, it didn't come to me with the dust cover, but this is kind of that transitional point where some did, some didn't. Still has the full Type 99 markings on the receiver. Would have had the chrysanthemum, of course. This one's been scrubbed off. A big change that Nagoya did, not all the arsenals did it, including Kakor, they did not, but they went to this simplified cylindrical cocking knob. And they, the, they did away with the plum. This is quite small, still usable, but the box magazine is unchanged. The safety no longer has the convex to it, it's flat. And instead of having checkering, it has diagonal lines. So it still has a pattern to it, but it's a much simplified pattern. Still very usable. You can still put the safety on quite easily, but it is simplified. Trigger guards unchanged for the most part. At this point, we still have the standard rear sling swivel here, two screws, and we still have a metal butt plate steel. But this was the one of the earlier and most noticeable simplifications, mid-war. I, I would call this style a mid-war Type 99. Still fully functional, but they kind of did away with all the doodads and gadgets and whatnot. This is, is a good example of something from uh, 1943. It's worth noting that the nine arsenals in Japan, they didn't implement all the changes at the same time, and different ones implemented different changes, so each series is a little bit unique. Hard to say, but I kind of like to stick to Nagoya. It's the original, and it's a good, good, good starting point. Well, next up we have a naval rifle. This is the Type 99 Naval Special from 1944. Yeah, if you haven't guessed it, by 1944 the Navy was again needing needing more guns and. All the production capacity was going to the uh, to the army, so they tasked the navy. That is, tasked their own shipyards and arsenals with making a uh, a version of the Type 99, and it came up with this, the Naval Special. This is a special critter for sure. This is a relatively early one. It has the full length wood. No provision. It has a small hole here, but there's no socket for a cleaning rod. Still has a bayonet lug. Still has a protected front sight, although it has simple round holes versus the more uh, stylish ones. Still has adjustable rear sight, but it's quite crude. In fact, this one is was cast to the point it's actually bent. It wasn't bent in service. It actually was was cast that way. No, uh, no front sling swivel. It has a simplified band attached with a squirt. Moving back here, no rear sling swivel either. All right, this does not have the chrysanthemum on the receiver, which is right for a Navy gun. It has the anchor. Notice this little inclusion here. Here. And there's another one somewhere in the back on this critter. This is another one of those little flaws. Right here. There it is. That's not damage. This receiver is cast iron. In fact, all the small bits on this gun are cast iron. The only steel on this whole gun 
is the barrel and the bolt body itself. Even this cocking knob is cast iron. Safety is cast iron, quite crudely machined too. Well, how do they get away with it without it blowing up in their face? What it does, if you also notice, this receiver is thicker here. It has these, these two step-ups. The barrel actually comes back all the way and has an extension, not unlike on an AR-15, and the bolt locks into that barrel extension. So all your receiver's doing on the Navy Special is holding all the bits together so they can get away with it being cast iron. I still would advise shooting these today. Um, you know, they weren't too strong 70 years ago, and, and age hasn't made them any stronger. The other parts, like this trigger guard, are very clearly cast. The front sights are cast. The rear sights are cast. Sometimes they would make their own castings. Other times they would use parts straight off a Japanese training rifle. So, an interesting gun. Between late 1944 and early 1945, Japanese uh, Navy, excuse me, construction yards would deliver about 6,000 of these to the Navy. Most were given to the Special Landing Forces and a few given to guards and, and on board ships. But most were given as, as landing rifles. They still did fire the 7.7 .7 cartridge. They didn't go to a weaker cartridge for it. As I said, this is an earlier one. Later ones would um, have cut back wood and fixed rear sights. This one, like the regular short rifle, has a 26-inch barrel. Later, they would go to a 22-inch barrel, which would be about right here. And they didn't so much do that to make a carbine as they did just to save that much on steel. Because by 1945, when that version would be out, every ounce of steel in Japan mattered. But yeah, the Naval Special, an interesting gun. You can also find these in stores a lot of times mismarked as uh, trainers because of all the cast parts. That's how actually I obtained this one. Uh, a local store I know, I talked to them and they said, hey, we've got a, we've got a Navy marked, has the anchor over here, we've got a Navy marked training rifle, do you want it? And I said, sure, and they said, well, 150 bucks. And, okay, a little much for a trainer, but I'll do it. Well, the time I got there, they said, well, we really like the the anchor and thinking about keeping it, not how I want it. And so I said, okay, $200. I think I said that they were negotiating. I was still okay with it because it was a naval special. So uh, these are not, not easy to find with only 6,000 made and who knows how many surviving the war. But um, yeah, yet again, the Japanese Navy kind of getting the leftovers and, and second best gear. But um, yeah. One of the uh, so-called last-ditch type guns used by the Empire of Japan. By the way, the reason I'm not opening the bolt is that this one's really stiff and sticky. I don't know why. I couldn't find any damage. It's just, I think, because of being cast parts and whatnot. All right, we'll move on. All right, next we have a substitute Type 99 often called the Last Ditch Arasaka. This particular one was manufactured by the Nagoya Arsenal in 1945 as part of Series 10. Still has the mum intact, which is kind of rare for these Last Ditch guns. Most of these have the mum scrubbed off. Well, you looked at the, uh, the Series 7 a minute ago, started to see some shortcuts. Obviously, by this point, this one was made in uh, early 45, they're starting to do quite a few changes. Well, starting at the muzzle, we have an unprotected front sight blade. No provision for a cleaning rod. If you look in there, it's just raw wood. Still has the Type 30 bayonet lug, of course. Has a simplified and welded barrel band. It's not no longer attached with a screw up here. It's just welded on. Rear band still has a screw in it. It also has a weld down here that's undressed. This one still has a front sling swivel. It has a short upper hand guard instead of going all the way out here. Now it stops obviously here, so saving on wood there. 
very simplified rear sight, just a simple peep. It basically is the exact same thing as what you would see on the standard Arasaka if the sight were folded down. Just the adjustable ladder is gone now. The hand grooves or the fuller grooves on the stock have been deleted. This piece, as you can tell, is separate from this back here, and they went from using a two-piece stock where it's joined down here and then a straight piece all the way around. Now they're using three pieces, one here, one from here to here, and then one from here to here. And the only thing holding this piece on is just the, the two barrel bands. There's no screws or anything going through it. So these are all loose like this. This isn't a problem. This is just how they made them. <laughs> By this point, you're not going to have any dust covers. And the Type 99 marking has been dropped from the receiver. Again, the chrysanthemum was left, but the Type 99, the, which is technically the year 999 type kanji, was, was left off. Still has the simplified bolt knob you saw in the previous one. Now it has just a straight welded safety. They didn't dress the welding anymore. All these had welded safeties, but they used to smooth it out and then even put checkering there. And now all that's gone, just, just a blob of weld. Your floor plate, trigger guard, trigger, pretty much un unchanged. Back here, the rear sling swivel. Let me see if I can fold it. It's no longer held with two screws, it only has one screw. That saved a screw and saved a little bit of metal here. And most notably to some is the fact that instead of having a steel butt plate, this is just a piece of wood, and instead of having screws to hold it on, it just has nails. It's pretty typical. Last ditch Nagoya. This is Series 10. They also completed a full Series 11, and then they started to get into Series 12, but they only produced a couple of thousand before the war ended. I have another last stitch over here. Set this critter down. This is a very late war, Series 25 from Kokora. Now, as you notice, they still use the plum knob on theirs. They always did, although it is simplified. It has this kind of flat edge here. They, they did save some machining. The safety is even more crudely welded on this one. The trigger guard is just straight across. It has no dishing to it internally. The floor plate is more simply uh, machined with just angle cuts as opposed to more rounded. The rear sight has the the corners just sticking up on the one you saw before they're kind of angled down they they lobbed them off to make them a little more streamlined this one they didn't the screw no longer has the washer type socket around it and the front barrel band is just again undressed welding and just kind of blobbed on there also Kokora always used the two screws type rear swivel still so then again, they, they implemented different changes at different times. There's a lot of chatter marks on this uh, wrist, too, from where they tried to carve it hastily. And you'll see lathe marks on the barrel on both of these. Now this one has a scrubbed mum, which is common for most late wars. There's lots of stories about those. Um, it seems very clear that the Japanese, when they did surrender the guns, took them off. If you see one that's been taken off with a lathe like this or some other machine tool, those are probably still in Japanese arsenals or even factories when the war ended, so this one's probably never even left the factory. But that, those are done by the Japanese. You'll see some where it's been hit with either like a chisel or a bayonet tip. People debate if Japanese soldiers did that in the field or if American soldiers did. No one really knows. There's a story that MacArthur ordered soldiers to deface the mums on their rifles for the Japanese honor thing. No one substantiated that, so who knows? It's just one of those uh, myths of the war. Could be true, maybe not true. Who knows? Some things that were never lost. Again, this is a Series 25 and relatively late, so it was probably made in July of uh, 45. Bolts still the same. 
still has a five shot internal magazine. Still takes the Type 30 bayonet, which they absolutely love. God, that's a heavy trigger on this one. <laughs> still, this one still has the rails for the dust cover, although it never had a dust cover on it. Some factories would delete these rails. I'm actually surprised that Nagoya and Kokora didn't, but there it is. Some factories even quit putting cereals on the side of the guns, but they always kept the chrysanthemum. That was one that they will, you'll see on all guns that were produced at least during the war. Yeah, this is the substitute Type 99 called the Last Ditch. I think the idea was if Japan won the war, they could go back and retrofit these back to Type 99 standards. I mean, everything you see, I mean, the, the receiver and the barrel are still good. You, you know, you can always throw on a different safety and a different buttstock. So I think the idea was these could always be retrofitted back to standard if they, if they needed to later, which obviously they never did. About one million of the 2,600,000 Type 99s produced were of this last ditch type pattern. So they were actually perfectly safe and usable guns, at least right up until the end. I'm not going to say some guns thrown together from parts collected by sweeping the floor of the factory just to get enough rifles together are safe, but anything produced before the immediate end of the war is still safe. In fact, a lot of them still had chrome line bores. The chrome line bolt face was done away with pretty early, but a lot of the last guns still had chrome line bores. Not all of them. You'll find some there where they dropped the chroming, but a lot of them still even had that. They're still reliable guns. They're still, I mean, this sight's crude, but it's very, very usable. You know, a 200, 300 meter fixed battle type sight, which is what most soldiers used anyway. So. You know, and the, the Japanese Arasaka was a, always a very strong action. You can read reports where U.S. Uh, testing showed that the Arasaka Type 38 and 99s were among the strongest receivers and whatnot produced in World War I or World War II. And uh, they still use the same type of receiver and all that, so they're still good guns as far as it goes. But yeah, this is the Japanese Type 99 Last Ditch. We'll move on. Alrighty, and for our final rifle of the day, this is kind of a bonus rifle. This is an interesting last ditch assembly. I don't want to say creation, but assembly. This is, it doesn't really have a name as far as Japan was concerned. American collectors call it the Type 0245. I don't necessarily like that designation, I prefer substitute type 35, but that's just me. It kind of seems more fitting with Japanese nomenclature. Well, in part one of our video, you saw the type 35 naval rifle. They said in that video, about 10,000 were produced, they all went to the Navy, they were in service a short period of time, and they were put into storage. Well, 1945 rolls around, and you guessed it, the Navy again needs more guns. So they've already tried the Type I, they've tried the Naval Special. What can they do? They, they, they see they have some old Type 35 receivers and barreled actions in storage. So they pull them out, some of them are in bad shape, some of them are incomplete. They do their best to reassemble them into working guns, and that's what this is here. Most people agree these are probably prototype receivers because they don't have the, uh, the rails for the dust cover and some other stuff. And the, the, no two of these are exactly alike because they're using whatever parts they had. So you've got a Type 35 barreled action, still has a 31 inch barrel, typical steel receiver, nice condition, quality bolt here, has the Type 35 style, the safety, the hook style. That's all, that's all fine. They're so good, good receiver, good barrel, good bolt. Probably honestly a better gun. Because this is built from an original Type 35. It's firing 6.5 by 50 cartridge, not 7.7. So they had that. They had to finish these things out though, finding whatever they could. Most of the parts on these are from training rifles. They're cast iron. 
like these rear sights, our trainer rear sights. The floor plate is cast. The um, trigger guard appears cast. Yeah, I'd say so. It's hard to know exactly. Bayonet lug. They use trainer parts on these. They also use parts from previously rejected manufacturing. They use parts from damaged rifles. For example, most of these are assembled into trainer, one-piece Japanese trainer stocks. This one here, though, came out with an old recycled Type 30 buttstock, which I thought was interesting. I actually obtained this rifle from my friend John years ago, and I thought it was kind of interesting for being in a Type 30 stock, and that is correct and original. Well, in 1945, pretty, pretty late spring, maybe early summer, about 1,500 of these were assembled. Most were kept on the home islands. A few went to the Japanese landing forces, but for the most part, they, they were just used as emergency defense type guns. But yeah, the, 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 the Type 0245 or substitute Type 35 is definitely an interesting and very much last-ditch gun. I find these unique because it shows even at the end Japan was still trying to be innovative, still trying to have guns, still still fighting, still had spirit left in it. I'm not speaking to the politics of the war, of course not, nothing like that. I'm just saying that the people themselves, Japan itself, was indomitable. They they were fighting and they kept fighting even when it looked hopeless. I mean that's the reason they, they fought for over three months longer than Nazi Germany did. They, they, they were not giving up easily. And this, this gun, along with other last ditches, really exemplifies that. Oh, most of these were never serialized either. They just have construction or assembly numbers, but not actual serials. I don't think most have a mum either. The markings are pretty erratic on these because they were using whatever they had. But yeah, this was part two in our Japanese series covering the guns of World War II. This is Misha, and if you have any questions at all, please post them below, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. Um, I've always liked these Japanese guns. I'm by no means a true expert or anything. Not like some of the guys out there that just have an encyclopedic knowledge, but I've always found these interesting, and, um, you know, at least have a passing acquaintance with them, and, and really just... You know, enjoy the Japanese Arasaka. When I was getting into collecting years ago, you could get Arasakas a lot cheaper than you could, say, K98s. And I thought they were mechanically interesting. I guess it goes back to watching some of the old Tales of the Gun series back on the History Channel in the 90s, you know. I'm sure some of you do. But yeah, just um, interesting pieces of World War II history. Anyway, if you have any questions, post them. Any comments, please post them. And as always, we really appreciate you viewing, and uh, stay tuned for part three to come out soon. Thanks for tuning in.